Uh, hi, Tamer Music fans. This is Michelle Schumann here. I'm here uh, this afternoon with Clive Greensmith from the Tokyo String Quartet. We're very, very glad to be with him here today. He's in between travels from various places and has been able to make the time for us. So thank you for joining us uh, today. Oh, my pleasure. This is for a festival focus blog where we're um, interviewing uh, festival artists coming up in July for the Austin Chamber Music Festival. And people are really abuzz with the Tokyo String Quartet coming uh, to town. I have to tell you, uh, the festival has been going on 15 years now, but I've been directing it for five years. And the first year that I came on to direct the festival, I, um, one of the big things that I wanted to do was bring a, a really major string quartet to town. And I had, in, I had in, uh, some ideas of my own, but I checked in with a lot of my string player friends. I'm a pianist. And right. I sort of uh, kind of got the consensus. And truly, the name that came up more often than not, was the Tokyo String Quartet. Oh, and, it sucks. Yeah, yeah and, um, and it took me five years to finally nail you guys down because you're always so very busy during the summer Yeah, very busy in summer, yeah. Yeah, so I'm really, really glad um, to be able to, to have you. Now, is this the first time that the Tokyo String Quartet is in Austin? I can't remember. I can tell you this, the first time that it's been, the quartet's been to Austin since I've been in the quartet, and that's now 12 years. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I'm pretty sure the quartet has played in Austin, uh, but it's uh, it's been a while. It's certainly, it's going to be more, probably uh, in the teens at least since yeah. it's played yeah. there. So it's great. It's yeah. wonderful. Thanks and, for inviting us. And you've definitely played in, in Texas, uh, correct? Yes. Uh, yeah. We play every year in Houston for the... Uh, that wonderful society that, that uh, we have, that wonderful form space at Rice. Uh -huh. We played uh -huh. as far afield as Amarillo. We played there once. San Antonio. Mm -hmm. I played in El Paso. We played in El Paso recently as a group too. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Corpus Christi. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, then you're very much due for Austin, and I know yeah. that Austin is very, very excited to. I like the city you. very much. I was there with an orchestra a long time ago. I really oh. was impressed. Yeah, Austin's a great city. I'm, I'm warning you, it will be very hot. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the, the touring schedule that the Tokyo String Quartet has, uh, has these days. I, I, I imagine you stay incredibly busy. Yeah, this has been a very busy season. Um, we've been to Europe three times. Um, we've been to Asia twice this season. We're going to go back again uh, just before we come to Austin, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got we've got around ninety something concerts. Uh, I lose track a little bit, and um, a lot of different repertoire and some recordings. Uh, plus, our teaching at Yale and mm -hmm. um, teaching in Japan. So we've been very busy, and I, I personally teach at the Manhattan School in New York. So it's been a very very right. uh, crowded, crowded year for us, but yeah. very uh, very satisfying. Lots of good good music and wonderful rep. Yeah, yeah. and when you when a quartet has been together as long as the Tokyo String Quartet has been together, what kind of performance practice or rehearsal practice do you have? I'm not talking about hours, but like how do you go about uh, old repertoire and new repertoire and right. uh, and that sort of thing? Well, I'd say it's a double-edged sword, Michelle. When you get um, to a, a sort of a, um, a familiarity uh, comfort zone with, with the core repertoire, mm -hmm. uh, it's good in that you don't have have to go back to square one when you uh, revisit a piece, but it's also challenging because you, you want to make it fresh and to make sure that uh, the uh, building blocks that are there that keeps the sort of machine of the quartet uh, well calibrated, being together, being in tune, those are all very laudable things. Mm -hmm. You need more than that just to, to justify bringing a piece back. Right. And sometimes it happens very naturally and it's great. And we'll rehearse a few a few hours on something something let's say like uh, the, the Mozart quartet the way is it the D minor I think yeah. that we're playing yeah. through mm -hmm. that piece we've been touring with a lot and we've played it now we've revisited that piece over the last few seasons but I find the best part about looking uh, at the piece again is to is to say let's try something different this mm -hmm. time and let's not rely on on those decisions and little pencil markings, the, right. the evidence from season 2009-10 or whatever, right. uh, and, and to try to make these pieces really relevant and meaningful again, without, in, in, not in a kind of a, um, a cliched way or right. in a way that we're trying to um, sort of force, force something, um, to remain open to what the pieces can, can offer. And they're always new, which is great. I mean, they're, they're never the same. And you put a piece once uh, in, in one program and then Surrounded with different works uh, at another time, it's always going to sound different, and right. hopefully, you find new things. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, I was thinking about that even for something like the Dvorak American Quartet that you'll be playing as well. And just the idea, I mean, I, I don't know when that piece first came into the, um, the repertoire of the Tokyo String Quartet, but even you as a, a newer member, um, yeah. coming into a group that has had you know, that piece be a formative part of their, their repertoire, how does that feel as the new person? I know you're not really, you're not new. <laughs> but, well, I'm relatively new. Uh, I'm uh -huh. sitting next to Abby Ellis, who's been in the group since the beginning. But yeah, I mean, for me, it's 12 years now. So a lot of the pieces that we learned in the first few seasons are coming back uh, several times now. Uh, we've just done the Beethoven cycle, and, and now we're, we're feeling our way with, um, yeah, what it's like to revive pieces that were pretty scary. Ten years ago, right. mm -hmm. and now they're they're less daunting. Mm -hmm. The challenge now is completely different. It's it's to uh, to of course to keep hold of the things that are hard and, and to keep them fresh. So you mentioned how do we go about that? I, I still practice a lot, and we practice as a group. We do you know our our daily routines, mm -hmm. morning rehearsals. Um, funnily enough, you mentioned Dvorak. Uh, what's nice about this group is that for me, is that they never had a big thing for Dvorak, so it was all very fresh. Mm -hmm. um, there are other quartets that, I mean, a lot of the Czech groups that have to play Dvorak and, right. mm -hmm. and exported Dvorak and, and mm -hmm. celebrated his music. Mm -hmm. We never really played much of his music. Mm -hmm. And so when we finally uh, undertook to, to play, you know, this piece, the, the, the American and other pieces, the quintet, the piano quintet, the viola quintet, mm -hmm. um, and other of the quartets, they were remarkably fresh. And I really enjoyed the fact there wasn't a kind of a, a tradition which uh -huh. might have not such good things associated with it, you know, a, a kind of a routine. So uh, I've, I've really enjoyed it. And I know it's a, a pot boiler, it's, it's a chestnut, as we say, but yeah. but actually I never get tired of that piece. Yeah. I absolutely adore it. It's got everything you could wish for. Mm -hmm. Okay, it may not be, uh, it, it, it may not have the kind of intellectual tautness of Weber or of late Beethoven, mm -hmm. but it has the uh, spiritual dimension, it has fantastic theme. Mm -hmm. Of course, has wonderfully catchy rhythms. It's beautifully crafted, and the audience always goes crazy at the end. Yeah, I think what that's yeah. I think that's the thing about almost all Dvorak, and especially the Dvorak chamber works, is that they just all yeah. have this life force. And I think it's because it's embedded right. in this folk style, so it's earthy exactly. and just has so much to say to people on it's a so human level. Exactly, mm -hmm. and um, and it's it. We need music like that because you can't easily succeed with an all Viennese program. Right. <laughs> um, and, and I have to say, Dvorak is, is a composer that I think in certain, at certain times and in certain places has been neglected and people have written him off for being just um, uh, another one of those nationalist composers at the end of the 19th century that uh, was going with the flow and didn't have right. much originality. Yeah. I think he's, uh, the depth of these late chamber works is phenomenal yeah. and uh, never get tired of playing them. Well, and if you think about the American Quartet, I mean, quite honestly, he was the first American composer. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, exactly. the way he was able to infuse, you know, American, Native American folk songs into his style, just the way he did with Czech folk songs, it's just, it's really yeah. remarkable. Yeah, you've got the My Country, Tis of Thee, mm -hmm. the American flag, and, you know, even in the quintet, the viola quintet, the E flat, you've got those wonderful kind of Indian drum motifs that always, right. mm -hmm. they're unmistakable. Yeah. And uh, uh, so he's very, very important for, yeah. for as you say, the prehistory of American modern American music. And yeah. So absolutely, yeah. we we claim him. I claim him anyway. <laughs> oh, rightfully so. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, I was I was I opened the interview just saying how much admiration people have for the Tokyo String Quartet and how it's just the the hallmark of the you know the. The, the great, really. And what were the quartets that you kind of grew up admiring, and uh, or even other members of the quartet grew up admiring? Well, for myself, um, I, I grew up in England, and um, so uh, I lived in London for a while, and my father was a headmaster, we moved around, so I, as a teenager, I was in, in the Northwest, and we didn't get a lot of great quartets, but what we did have was a fantastic record store, mm -hmm. so... Uh, I used to go in and uh, buy these LPs with m marvelous big color pictures on. And actually, uh, as a young, young sort of musician in my teens, I, I'll never forget two very important moments. One was uh, picking up in a record store a second-hand copy of the Guarneri Quartet. Mm -hmm. 
and it was a box set of them playing Opus 59, Beethoven, mm -hmm. and I couldn't, uh, I'd never heard of this group, so I thought, well, they look pretty good from the picture, and there was a one of Rubenstein as well, with uh -huh. Quint, and I took them home, I saved up, I was used to go there, I went to the pre-college at the Royal Northern, and I, every time I'd go on a Saturday, I'd hang out in this bookstore, which sold records as well, but uh, it was a great place, of course, this doesn't exist anymore right. now, no. <laughs> We have so the internet these, now. <laughs> right, right. So I used to hang out there and and um, browse for an hour or so every every weekend, and I'd have enough money to bring one or two records back. And I put it on the turntable. I thought I heard the beginning of Opus Fifty Nine Number One, and I had these chords and this sound, and I thought we don't have string playing like that in England. It doesn't sound. It's thin and reedy over here, and this this group is so rich, and they 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 play with such virtuosity, and it just sounds just so much more impressive and, and deeper than everything I've heard here. And then uh, I heard the other extreme, I had all these Czech groups which I really loved um, playing their own music, we just touched on that, Janacek, uh, Smetana, and I thought they were great too. And then when I heard the Vermeer Quartet live, that was my first live quartet concert, I was about 15, and my child teacher said, they're coming, you've got to hear them, they're just great. And they played with Peter Frankel, and I remember the exact program. It was 59 number one, where you know, the uh, Brahms piano quintet, and there was some um, some uh, Mozart in the middle. And uh, and I remember asking them up backstage, the cellist. I said, "Oh, how much rehearsal did you have?" And he said, "Well, we went to Peter Frankel's house, and we read it in London yesterday, and we played it today." And I thought, "Wow, how could you do that?" Right. <laughs> and so I was just bowled over by how how great this group was. And then I really began to get very, very interested in chamber music, and I wanted to have my own group. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was something which uh, it was the problem was always getting people together in one place that wanted mm -hmm. to play. And then later I went to Marlborough. I was very happy to to be selected. I, I had a, gr a very, very moving experience. I played for David Sawyer, and he said, "Yes, you can come. You pass the audition." And then I couldn't go because I hurt my hurt my hand at a repetitive oh, strain injury. And I had to call up and say, I'm sorry, I, I can't come, I, I've been told not to play. Anyway, I thought, oh, that's it, I'll never get back there. But uh, I called, uh, it's when it got better, a year and a half later, and he said, well, Clive, we've been waiting for you to get better. And I said, do I have to re-audition? He said, no, no, come along, come along. And <laughs> he kept the place open for me for two years. Mm -hmm. And that's when my love of change, it really um, crystallized into mm -hmm. serious groups, and I got my confidence back, and, and then came to America, and I and the Tokyo's were looking, and then I joined them. So um, uh, the, the, I would say the Quinary Quartet, very, very important, and David Sawyer in particular, because he he got me to, to Marlborough. He liked my playing, and he supported me, and, and I had terrible, you know, with an injury like that. It was a lot of challenges, you know, you didn't feel particularly good about yourself and you know, I was in my early twenties, I felt like I wasn't going anywhere and it healed and mm -hmm. and, and my route back to to music and to enjoyment was, was through orchestra as well, but through, through the quartet inevitably. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And you know, it touches on something that I think audiences are often very curious about in terms of musicians and how they treat their hands and how they take care of themselves in a way because in many ways musicians are very much like uh, high performance athletes yeah, and athletes, how we yeah. need to treat, treat our bodies and we put them through the rigors over and over uh, again. Yeah. And can you, can you talk about that maybe from the, the standpoint that you had an injury at one time, how do you guard against injuries in the future and how do you treat yourself yeah. as an athlete? Well,